This is. This is very serious. We are now live, Chef David Schwadron and family. So happy to have everybody here. How are you doing? I'm happy to be here. Oh, I'm so happy to have you here, David Schwadron. So we are now, um, I'm going to give you a chance to speak because I know that you like to do that. But first I get to introduce you and what we are doing here today. So today is um, our third in their Memories from the Kitchen series where we have featured different um, chefs or cooks from the Jewish kitchen um, in all of this in preparation for the High Holy Days. Throughout the month of Elul, we have had numerous different programs and this is one of them where it helps people get connected uh, more to the taste, the sounds, the feelings, the spirituality of our High Holy Days. And so we are talking about nothing else but today about memories and food. And what better things do Jews do than recall memories and, and eat good food? Always, all the time. Even a shiva is a good time to eat food. Um, I think Judaism is all about family. It's about togetherness. It's about reenacting traditions and creating shared memories around a table. In fact, our table in our home is called a mikdash me'at, a small sanctuary where we have transported the spirituality and the ritual um, practices of the big temple into our home, so much so that the home is the heart and the center of where we do most of our rituals and our um, Jewish connections and practices. So, you know, the fact that you made this your lifelong passion and ambition is perfect for you, especially with um, your upbringing. The fact that um, you went to yeshiva and you fancy yourself a rabbi in the off parts of your life and a chef. You've got it all together, David Schwadron. Um, besides the fact that you are known in our community for being a wonderful um, chef, um, cater to so many different aspects of our Jewish lives and our secular lives, but you're also a dear friend of mine and an um, incredible uh, person in our community that we all turn to and know and love. So without due respect, I'm so thrilled to have you here and to present Chef David Schwadron. Uh, thank you for those kind words. I appreciate it very much. And it is true what you say about food and family. And since I am here with some of my family, I would like to introduce um, my sous chefs, Emmy Schwadron and Tali Schwadron, both of them actually middle names in Hebrew named Miriam, after my mother, who was my major influence growing up. And so when you talk about food and family, um, from Shabbos dinner every week, it was very important to us. And so I really did love food growing up, and that's what made me become or go into the food business. I'm not a trained chef. I didn't take any classes to become a trained chef, but I did always have this love of food and sharing and celebrating. Uh, my parents' home was always opened, as mine is, to people and strangers and to teach them new traditions and new foods and new customs. Um, my home, my mother, every year for Sukkot, uh, that was one of her major holidays, would invite hundreds of people um, yeah. To, uh, to our sukkah party. Uh, they became uh, infamous. And even today, people come up to me and remember and say, oh, I remember your sukkah parties. And the, the tradition was to hand out a jelly apple. Um, and so everybody got a jelly apple at the end. And that was very nice. And What's a jelly so, apple? That's it, not like the little- apple. It's those apples um, glazed in red. In like oh, red can, we call them candy, candy apples apple. by day. A candy apple. And uh, yes, candy apple. And uh, so that's how I kind of grew up with that of love, family, food. Um, but it was also about Hashem. And it was about, you know, being Jewish and how do we, and Yiddishkeit, and how do we elevate our experience. And so those became, even though you think of them as traditions, they just became normal way of life. And so those do become our traditions. And here I am, the door by door. My daughter-in-law is here. Um, Michelle, come in for a quick hello. Also one of my sous chefs and hello, my wife, Shelly. It's Michelle. Hi. And I'm actually in my son, Josh, and Michelle's kitchen here in the Hudson Valley. And with a lot of fresh produce, Michelle has an amazing garden outside. And so it's just been a pleasure living up here and just getting everything 
literally not just from the farm, just from our backyard to the table. And we actually recycle it all because we have two compost piles, one for the chickens and one for the vegetable garden. And so it's really nice to be able to, to go that and even carry on the tradition of ladybugs and using that as a natural way of fertilizing our fruit trees, right? Mm -hmm. And the girls help do that. So, so what are we making here today? So I was gonna say today for Rosh Hashanah, I decided, so my mom would always talk about a shachiyoni for us. And so it was very important and there were certain fruits that we'd all, always do for shachiyoni. And one of them that was the most remembering from my childhood was a pomegranate. And so we're gonna talk about pomegranates and we're gonna use this later on in our chicken. But because I've always believed in cooking classes being very simple, um, we're going to make a chicken today. It's kind of a Moroccan chicken with fresh plums, but because it's Moroccan, we're also gonna use some dried fruit. And because it's Yantif and everybody's into apples, what we're going to do is we're gonna start with the assistants here and we're gonna make some baked apples. And people usually make baked apples with raisins or dried fruit. But just to have a little fun today, we're going to make it with Milky Ways. And there's nothing like a little chocolate and caramel to take it out. So in order, the apples, while they might be flat, in reality, everyone is different, just like all of us are different. And um, so one of the things I like to do is to is to just kind of trim the bottom of the apple to make it flat. And it's gonna be much easier for us to work on when it's flat like that on the bottom. I don't wanna break all the way through because I want to, um, I don't want the filling to come out the bottom. So what I'm gonna let Emmy do is I'm gonna get it started. Emmy and Tali, I'm gonna let them scoop out the apple and I'm going to show you how easy this is. You know, I grew up in an era where every baked apple was made with diet soda. Uh-huh. So That's what we used to do. I still can continue that tradition today. You want a scoop? And I'll give you a different spoon. I have a little spoon here for you to scoop. Emmy, just keep on this. Nice spoon. to have some sous chefs with you. These are my sous chefs. And today was Tali's first day of school. <gasps> And How was it, Tali? Emmy has her first day of school. So today, I like different flavors. I like Fresca. Today, we are using Dr. Mountain Dew. I mean, Diet Dr. Mountain Dew. And so, not Dr. Pepper. I've used Dr. Pepper, too. So, make a little bit more. All I'm going to do is cut the Milky Ways in half. We're going to stuff the apples with the Milky Way. We're going to put them in a pan with a little bit of soda. And just for tradition, I do put in a little raisin. It kind of helps flavor the soda, but it also makes the apples really good. You can do one of these and put one on that plate for me. So actually just bring me over the whole tray. So what we do here is we scoop this out and we just scoop it out a little bit more. And then we- You did mine. You did great. You did really good. And then we're literally going to just take the candy and put it inside the apples, put it inside of a pan. And I got it. Okay. Just gonna put it we're going to put it inside of a pan. And then we're going to add a little bit of soda. And through the magic of television or the magic of Zoom, Michelle, can you tilt a little or lift it up? There's our apricot or apples and if you can see the chocolate and the caramel just sits in here and Whoa. it is amazing right babe? really hot yes hot. okay later so let's so that's a quick little baked apple tree just so we got we did the whole tradition of apples um and sweetness and today's chicken is going to be a sweet chicken now i usually am a very eclectic chef where I kind of just wing it and do it and it's wonderful. But just so that I can make this recipe the same way all of you did, I'm actually going to use 
the recipe that Robin is gonna share with everybody. And I assume there'll be a, li a link on Facebook for it also. So you get this recipe. One of the reasons I chose this too is my mom used to make, good job, Tali. You want to keep going or you want me to put it away? We'll start because we're going to start the chicken. Uh, my mom used to always, sometimes for us, young tip, we were observant. And so we didn't go to shul so much Arab Rosh Hashanah. We did stay home for our big meal because you had to walk to shul or walk home from shul. And so our big, big party really was Saturday lunch after Yontif. So after shul, um, not Saturday, Yontif lunch, uh, we would come home and my mother would sometimes make a lot of chicken marbella because mm. it had sweet fruit in it. And it gave me the idea of using fresh plums, which are in season right now. And plums are one of the last fruits to be harvested. And so while peaches and nectarines and apricots might be out of season, plums are here. One of the nice things about this chicken is there's no searing involved and everything could be made um, a day in advance. As a matter of fact, it should be made a day in advance because we need that to incorporate all the flavors. So to make it easy, we are gonna make this entire chicken in one two gallon Ziploc bag. And it's gonna make it nice, easy, and clean. I want this recipe to be easy for everybody so that they can do it. And that there's no excuse, I can't see this or, or, or deglaze or do or whatever it is. Although I know a lot of my friends out there watching are in their own right professional chefs. So we're going to start. David, you called yeah. for in the recipe um, a whole large four pound chicken. Are yeah. you, do you prefer the whole versus the pieces? I actually, I put that out there for everybody, but I actually prefer the pieces. And so when we do do this, you're going to see that I did start with, in the recipe calls for some thighs and some, um, some breasts. And so what happens sometimes with a whole chicken is that some people get a very small piece and other people get a very large piece. And so this becomes much more uniform and much easier to do. And so I'm actually, this, right here on this chicken is six bone-in um, thighs and two breasts cut in half. Mm -hmm. And so you can see these breasts and the thighs are all about the same size, excuse me, so that they cook evenly. Um, what I'm going to do is just slip this right into the bag and then I'm gonna let my sous chefs um, help me with all of the ingredients. Very important after, for everybody always after touching chicken just to um, always wash. This is, and I'm out of camera, this is not just a COVID wash, but a, um, a health wash. So now, now I have a base to work from. Uh, Emmy, Mommy, if you can do it? the olive oil. You know. I just posted the uh, ingredients for people if they want to see it in the chat. Right. Take, a, take a look, Michelle. Rochelle. Okay, so this calls for a half cup of olive oil. Go ahead. And if you don't want to use that much olive oil, you don't have to. Uh, I'm trying to balance it with the vinegar. There's a sweetness to this and a little bit of sour. Later on, we're going to add some lemon, but we're going to add a lot of dried fruits. All right, go ahead. And there's the, the vinegar. We're going to have, when it comes to plums, I wanted you to see, we have a couple of different styles of plums. So today we're going to be using prunes. And a prune actually comes from what's called a prune plum. Some people call them Hungarian plums. I actually heard somebody the other day call it a German plum. But these are little, these are the plums that they use to dry out to make prunes. So we're going to, I'm gonna let Emmy if she wants, we're gonna slice one little bit, okay? And then I'll start working on the dry ingredients. So what I'm gonna do is let you cut it up, all right? And I'll let Tali help me with one of the dry ingredients. 
So I, I'm going to have you cut to. Okay, doing great. So this was also a measured. Th this was also a measure. Okay, perfect. Thank you to my sous chefs. I'm actually going to move this onto this side so that Grandpa can do a little knifing myself here. Okay, Tolly, I want you to. You have another knife, Michelle. I'll get one here. Tolly, here I'll give you this one. And so what's nice about the whole plums is that you literally, I don't know if you could see this, but you could literally cut them around the edges and then almost like an avocado, twist and turn. And then just the, the pit or the seed will just pop right out. Even the seeds are in the compost pile. Everything goes in the compost pile. And so what I would do with these is I'm going to leave these just quartered like this. They are going to shrink. If you cannot get that kind of small prunes, then you can just use larger prunes. I'm sorry, larger plums and, um, and smaller slices into quarters. So it says only a cup. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to make it a fuller cup. And okay. so when you start thinking here, put this in here, put this in here. Well, one of the reasons I'm doing a cup of this and a cup is because we also have a lot of dry ingredients. I didn't want it to be too over proportion. So what I personally use much more fresh, but I wanted everybody in their recipe to have the ability to um, kind of create it on their own and see what's comfortable for them. It is a Moroccan chicken. And so Moroccan chicken already is going to have apricots in it and prunes as well as olives. So it's not just a prune plum. It's not just a plum chicken. And now we can take this, those plums. Emmy, you want to put it in here? David, growing up, can I ask you a couple questions while you're doing sure. that? Sure. I'm, so I'm, when you were growing up in your Orthodox household, were you, did you always have um, some kind of a chicken for Shabbos? Um, actually, we did have, but we were very American. Even though we were very observant, we were very American. And our Shabbos dinner was always literally standing prime rib roast. Because that was like a very 19, early 1960s, like that was the best meal you could have. And so my mother wanted the best for Shabbos. And so every Shabbos, the dining room was beautifully set and it was always our best dishes and our best glasses. And so it was whatever the best could be. Um, I grew up, you said earlier that I went to like a yeshiva day school and a lot of my friends were, I'm fourth generation American. All my grandparents basically were born in America. So it wasn't a lot of Eastern European food in my house. Luckily, the school I went to, a lot of my friends were first generation. Their parents came from either Europe or survived the Holocaust. And so I would go to their house to learn about Simis and Shalant and Stavkogel and Kishka and all of you know, the kind of fun you know, Jewish foods. Did you uh, uh, like to uh, be in the kitchen when you were a kid too? I did. I was, um, I was happy in the kitchen. It was fun for me. We, uh, did a lot of cooking in there and it was always good food. And it was just like you said, it was food and celebration. And, and then Shabbos, you know, Yontif was important, but obviously Shabbos happened, you know, 52 weeks a year, but Yontif was really special. Um, but Shabbos every week, there was always visitors and always guests. And so it was really, it was really very special. Um, Rosh Hashanah was, and Yom Kippur, you know, it was funny because um, on Rosh Hashanah, we always had beautiful round challahs and lots of honey and lots of sweet foods. And we always talked about, you know, trying to know what was changed in our year. And how did we look on our previous year? It was kind of almost a reminder of how could we reset our lives and what did we do last year and what are we proud of? And what weren't we so proud of? And how could we change for next year? And my parents were very positive people. And they always taught us to, to look at things in a positive way and try and better ourselves and just be nicer, um, you know, nicer to ourselves and nicer to the world around us. 
you know, tikkun olam and tzedakah uh, was just a natural part of our everyday lives growing up. Um, so I wanted to go through some of the dried fruit. And you, the, are you so, sharing that with your with granddaughters? Four, of course, I, I share it very well with them. <laughs> and they share it with me because they also give me an interesting perspective on how life is. Emmy, prior to this, had gone to Central Synagogue and, and Tali went there too. They're now gone, going by Zoom. But we would go there for Shabbos and I learned a lot of things from them. Are you going to wash on me? And then I want you to do the apricots. Um, but whatever it is, the food is important, but the conversation around the table is even more important. And so we have, we're always in a table where we share. And even to this day, you know, yes, I'm a little shy, but somehow I manage, oh, yeah. somehow I manage <laughs> to, um, to, 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 to let it out there. Right, now I need a cup of apricots, please. So, so maybe that's what sets um, Shabbat different from all other nights. You know, we, we get home from work late. We're, you know, we, we probably don't have time to make a meal. But Shabbat is that time for just taking a breather and settling in and not having to rush out. I remember when, when my kids were young and um, they would want, they were in the high school years where they wanted to go out with their friends. And I said, listen, this is the deal. If you mention one time, that what, what time can you leave and how much longer the deal's off. There's no going out. It, I don't want to hear the, feel the pressure. I want it to be in the moment. I want to be with you. And I want to don't, ha I, I just want that off. So, and that for us is what, ha what set the difference between, but then again, then they all only wanted their friends over on Shabbat and their friends only wanted to be with us on Shabbat because guess what? It's like our party, right? That's exactly what happened at our house. We were the cool house because we had these great Shabbos dinners and everybody wanted to participate. And it shows you that if you do make it like that and you make it warm and inviting with good food and good conversation and good wine, um, that people will come. And it's good stories. And it's about the Pasha of the week or some, some Hasidic stories or good, good, feel good type of stories or conversation. It's very important to let everybody at the table share how they feel. I think we're going to have one more participant, possibly, young Toby, but we'll see if he makes it or not. But one thing I wanted to say while well, Emmy is here, and some of you might remember this, but it was seven years ago this past March that I was doing a, a cooking class for Pesach. And Pesach was early that year, and it was on March 7th, and and I came to the class, and this was at Beth Am, and I had about 30, 40 people there. And I said, I just want you to know, my daughter-in-law went into labor, and uh, I might have to like leave, you know, in the middle of the class, go out, and they're in New York, I'm in Miami, and see what's happening. And I think right after I got out the main course, you know, I was so, it was a tough night for me. Um, and then right after the main course, I got the call, and we found out that Emmy was born. And, um, and it was very exciting. It was tough to come back after that, but it was a little emotional and it was really nice, but it was very special. And even to this day, many people uh, come up to me and say, oh, I remember that class and that day. Yeah. You can see um, I told Emmy before we got on here that um, I, I feel like she's part of my family because, you know, David and I, your grandpa and I have been studying Torah together for I don't even know how many years. And every Shabbat, we would have a report on what Emmy was doing. My Emmy, and my Emmy this, and my Emmy that. And so we always, we knew everything that was going on in your life. And we had not really met you um, over the years, but your grandfather was quelling, as they say, a little bit. Yes, more than a little. And now we have Tali and Toby. And I'm also blessed to have six other grandchildren that live exactly. in Colorado and Miami and all of Kentucky and Ohio. So um, I am very, very blessed. All right. So what are we cooking there, Dave? We are, so now we've kind of done the sweet part. We've done the apricots. We've done the plums, the prunes. I added some more. And now we're going to add some of the savory. And the first thing we're going to do to balance a little bit more of that sweetness is use a lemon. And I'm just going to slice this very thin. It's going to give us a little sweetness. It's going to deglaze a little when we're cooking it. It'll shrink a little. Lemon is very popular 
in, um, in Moroccan cooking. And when you're slicing a lemon thin, and I should have started this way, very similar to the apple, you should just slice a teeny, teeny bit off the bottom of the lemon so that it sits flat on the table. Nice. And that becomes much easier to slice because you really do want it to be paper thin. So you do you ever make preserved lemons? So I have made preserved lemons inside of that. That is going to be a different cooking class. Okay. Because I saw all this fresh fruit and I said, you know, this is perfect to pop them all in. And our next ingredient um, after the lemons is a couple of bay leaves, which are important. We're going to pull them out at the end. Remember, this chicken is going to marinate even longer than 24 hours. Because this chicken, you should make, Yuntif is Friday night. You could make this chicken Thursday morning in a bag and put it, leave it in the bag. And then Friday afternoon at five o'clock, you're yeah. going to see how easy it is to, to do that. So we're going to add some bay leaf, uh, garlic. So obviously here's a big head clove of garlic, but I actually prefer just going to the store and buying, you know, the, the ready peeled garlic. But whether you use a clove and open it up with your hands and wind up with a couple of a little dryer. If you have a whether you have a clove that's in the skin or a clove that's not in the skin, the easiest way to kind of cut it and do it, I don't know if you could see this, is to take the side of your knife and the palm of your hand and just kind of smash it. The skin will come right off and it will be already cut up for you that'll make it much easier to cut. So I'm going to use these, you know, five or six or 10 cloves, I think it calls for. Just eight to 10. Them. Eight rough to 10. Chop. Eight to 10, rough chop. If you like more garlic, add more garlic. If you need less garlic, add less garlic. When it comes to onion, if you see these lines, Hashem gave us these lines as literally the way to cut. And so all we do is just literally slice on these lines. And when you do that, if you slice your onion the other way, it will completely disappear. So if you slice it this way, the onions will, you have not broken the membrane and let out the liquid. And so, as I always like to say, Hashem works in mysterious ways, but here, here is a, a roadmap to cutting a, a um, an onion and obviously our Torah and family and everything is our roadmap to living our lives. So we're going to put a whole onion in here and then um, we still need like the only liquid that you put in there is olive oil and red vinegar. A little right? olive oil and red vinegar. This is not a juicy steamed chicken. This is more of a roast chicken. If you would like to add a cup of wine at the end, uh, you can. We are going to serve it with some couscous, and you can add a little liquid. But over the years, I found it to be a little too, I, I prefer it like fork and knife. Yeah. And you'll see it when it's finished, um, how nicely it came out. And then, Emmy, I could use, uh, where's our tablespoon? I could use a tablespoon of um, cumin, which again, we're going back to our Moroccan flavors. So you can put some cumin in there. And you could put some, uh, oh, this is just cinnamon. We're just going to use a little pinch of cinnamon for this. Cinnamon is something that you should not taste, but will add a little familiarity. And here's some oregano. You can put some oregano in. And then we're going to add a little bit of paprika. This one, I'll just fill up. So we're going to add a little paprika. And I think, believe the recipe calls for even two of these, but since we're not going to cook this batch through the magic of television, um, we're going to be able to do this. In addition to this, obviously salt and pepper. For me, I never pour salt or pepper. I always like to just kind of put it in my hands and feel it. Uh, and this way, is that enough? Is that a little? So it's always good just to use pinches of salt. 
Um, and that way you could control your salt. You could you like using add, kosher salt the best? Kosher salt's the best. Uh, this is kosher salt. I actually, do I like the blue box or the red box? One of them I like because it's, uh, I, like I like the, the red, red box. I, really like the blue. I think I like the blue. Michelle likes the red. It's a little more grainier for me. Um, the last thing we're going to do, I didn't see we did this, is we're going to add the uh, olives. And today we're adding both Kalamata and we're adding. It's um, these Green. amazing Castelvio olives. And, and these are just pitted, beautiful green olives. Do they have the pimento in there? There's no pimento. These are just olives. And you know what? If there is some brine with it, most times I like to rinse my olives because I don't like that brine. But in this case, I'm OK with the brine. David, what's the difference between the, this recipe and the Marbella chicken? It seems very similar. They're similar in the sense that you, that you can cook them all in a bag and they have similar ingredients. The difference here is the seasonings. Here we're using um, cumin and cinnamon and paprika and, and, and we're using um, dried fruits. And so you're going to get more of a Moroccan feel and flavor for it. And I kind of love that Israeli feel and taste the Sephardic. I was lucky, uh, one of our neighbors growing up were Persian. And so we ate a lot of Persian food growing up. Um, there weren't a lot of Israeli restaurants, you know, it wasn't. So I kind of got a taste for that, for that food early on. And so um, you could see, look at this. Is this great? It's a wow. big bag. I love that you put that in the bag. That it's is so, as Randy says, it's a, a one potter. It's really, for sure. Um, <laughs> that's my smoking buddy. I know. Um, I he misses it. you. I did it early on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, when I come back, uh, otherwise we'll do a smoke. I'm actually up here. I'm going to probably do a smoke brisket. Nice. For, uh, for, for, the, for Rosh Hashanah? A little, a little side. Randy and I created, so during COVID, we were playing around, Randy and I. I was brining, Randy was smoking. Is it, is it live? Uh oh, hold on. We got to make sure to mute everybody. Uh oh, hold on. Hold on. Wait, I think you're on. The black hey, you're on wait, you're unmuted. Sorry, go ahead. Okay. So, um, as I was saying, so Randy and I were playing during COVID, I was brining, he was smoking, and you know, we made an amazing, few amazing things, and we made a pastrami that oh, was going for like 12 days. That was so fun. good. So then we said, how did we top the, I almost want to pull out a picture of it. So he said, how do we top that one? And then we made pastrami short ribs. And that is still one of the best things. I don't think I've had meat since then. That's how much we ate. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to just kind of mix this by hand. And you play, you want the couscous on the bottom in the middle. And I'm going to just kind of, kind of get this going everywhere. And it's really nice to be able to do that. And then you're just literally going to let it sit in the bag um, overnight. And literally the next day, I always let it sit on the sheet pan, and if you notice, I put foil on the sheet pan that is going to help me stay clean because it's very important to, um, if you're going to cook, it's good that you don't feel like there's so many dishes or so much, you know, it, it, it prevents people from cooking. And I don't want that to be. And it's one of the reasons, excuse me, why I picked this recipe. I could have picked a recipe um, that um, was much more difficult. But I do want people to, um, to do this. Let me pick the other just before. David, how long do you have to leave it um, out before you actually cook it? So I'm OK going any, for me, the longer you let it sit on the counter, the less you have to have it in the oven. So I'm OK with at least one hour. And 
if not longer, but at least one hour for it to come to room temperature, and it'll be more likely to cook more even. But it's and okay to be at room temperature. I'm always okay. concerned about the like salmonella or three. Um, you have three. You know what? I, if you could wait one second, because I want to show them how much liquid I did get. So yes, you're going to mush this all up. It's going to be great. Now it's tomorrow, and we're literally going to. No, no, sorry. It's, you're fine. I just want you to do it. So now you literally Sorry. take this bag, put it out on the put it out on the tray. I want to lay it skin side up. Now it's interesting. We were talking. I want to put it all skin side up, and then I'm going to rearrange the vegetables. It's interesting you talk about um, Sheikh Yunis and. For us, it was all about uh, pomegranates. Um, there must have been, and it was tough for me, even this year, I could not get a pomegranate literally till yesterday. Really? And I kept calling, I kept going to markets going, I need a pomegranate, I need a pomegranate. And uh, as you know, you and I um, switched some of these things around because it, and it, at my sister's house the other day, I bought in some champagne grapes. Um, or wine grapes. And she goes, we can't eat those. We need that for our Shekh Yoni. And she remembers that from my mother after I left and lived in Miami. So there must have been one year early when Rosh Hashanah came in early where that became a tradition because there were no pomegranates. But it's important to say a Shekh Yoni. I mean, I still say a Shekh Yoni every time I get a new shirt or a new pair of shoes. It was something that was taught to us. Um, that to be thankful that, you know, what is the Shekh Yuni blessing? The Shekh Yuni blessing is, you know, thank you, God, for this bringing me to this point, at this place, at this time, at this moment. It might be with people. It's a blessing I like to do sometimes at the table because it's a certain group of people who have not been together or have not been together in a while. But it also comes that way with clothing. And it's almost like, I'm blessing this for this first time to, to give me luck and to, you know, have good energy and, and a blessing, you know, for that, just like we say blessing on food. So everything is kind of arranged. Can you see this? Yes, it's so beautiful. Right? And I kind of put the lemons on the top. And the last thing we're going to do is I have a very famous artist right here next to me. And she's going to paint pomegranate um, syrup. And pomegranate syrup, let me just wash this, I want to show the bottle. One second. Pomegranate syrup, you know, for those of you, you know, you, you can get it at Whole Foods, you can get it at Daily Bread, you could get it, you know, almost anywhere. Um, but pomegranate syrup is basically pomegranate juice um, with a little bit of um, reduced with sugar. This is the brand I'm just using today, but there's a million of them. And you can see how thick it is that it goes against the bottle. Emmy, I got, you got a paintbrush. And after you're done, you can sign your name like you did on some of the other artwork here in the house. You start brushing this, start brushing all the tricks in. Okay, so let her do that. I'm gonna take one look. Um, Okay. David. Yeah, I'll be what, back in a second. What was uh what's one of the recipes that your mom used to make that you have the fondest memories of? That just like so, brings you back. So, you know, obviously Shabbos dinner was um, you know, and even today prime when I eat out the prime rib. But my mother was, like I said to you, we were very American. So, you know, we ate chicken, we ate lamb chops, we didn't eat a lot of Jewish food. But lamb chops um, was probably, and you know, I'm famous for my lamb chops. So it really is interesting how that worked. Do you make it the same way? I do not. I don't think my mother knew about za'atar and pistachios oh, right. uh, back then. Did you, what about your bubby, like your, your grandmother? So my one grandmother, um, her famous thing was bran muffins. And my other grandmother um, wasn't that big of a cook but they lived next door to us, so they would eat in our home. But I didn't have that, you know, it was interesting. I, 
would get that experience from some of my friends' parents and grandparents. Like I remember for Shavuos eating, you know, Mrs. Rosen's, you know, kugel and blintzes. You know, blintzes and kugel were not something we, we made growing up, but I spent so much time in my friends' homes and kitchens. When you're observant, you tend to spend Shabbos in their houses or Yontif in their houses, and you do that every week. So it really becomes family. So, but I do have a lot of those memories. Um, and now my children, it's kind of the opposite. I was a good cook. I really did cook all the time. And so, you know, they grew up with a much different um, food presentation. So you ready to go in the oven? You all painted? You want to sign your name? Somewhere? You get your pencil? No. All right. So this is kind of our finished dish. It yeah. looks great. Uh, through the magic, through the magic of television, or Zoom, I only have the, so I kind of, we're in the middle of plating it, I'll take both. So we're in the middle of plating, so what I did is, I put a big wow, spoon. and how long did that cook for? It took about 45, 50 minutes, but I wanted you also to see, and I don't know if you found how much liquid we did wind up with. Um, no, it's hard to see. Your head up. Can you look the iPad, the, uh, the thing up? Can you see? Oh, yeah. You can see. So what I would finish doing, and this is a traditional, okay, thank you, Shell. This is a traditional. Um, is that couscous in the middle? Moroccan. This is a traditional, sorry, okay? okay? okay. So this is a traditional Moroccan presentation with couscous in the middle. This could easily be basmati rice, or for Emmy, it would be pasta. For Tali, it would be pasta. For Toby, it would be pasta. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, that's, is that what's going to happen someday when you're a famous chef on television? And they say, what did my mother, what did you have growing up that your mother made really good? What's your answer going to be? Pasta. <laughs> pasta. <laughs> so we're going to plate it all of these vegetables. If you can see them, they're squishy and just easy. I'm going to present it all on top, around. Um, There's plenty of liquid without it being soupy. It's I can't believe that that was only 45 minutes. I would think that it would have to be longer to get that well, dark. Um, yeah, well, remember the pomegranate syrup is a caramelization. Yeah. So, you know, I have it at 375 degrees in a... Um, I'm in 375 degrees in a convection oven, and now I'm going to take all this juice. Oh, that's the best part. And now that, and then you need the challah to soak, soak it up. I have a great new recipe for challah with dried shallots. Ooh. And it reminds me of the onion pockets. I mean, you could say the onion pockets of Joe's or the onion pockets from Butterflake Bakery or oh, Loose Bakery where the onions get so soft. Uh, if you go onto Amazon and you put in Amazon kosher shallots, it's literally listed as kosher dried shallots. There's a, it's actually a company up in Plantation who bags them and it's amazing. Those and what do you do? You uh, just, uh, you put it into the mix? I actually put it into the mix. Uh, you could hydrate it a tiny bit. You don't want to over hydrate because you don't want to offset the balance of your water on your flour but I put it into the mix. And if you're make, making multiple hollas and you split your doughs up, you could add it to that dough. And then when I braid, I add even more to it to the braids. And, and I over egg wash a little because you don't want the top to burn. So the finishing touch on this, and you can see how nice and crispy wow. those lemons got. That's um, awesome. Is to garnish it with Traditionally, you garnish couscous with nuts. So I have some almonds, but I'm going to do it on the entire dish. I have some almonds, and my favorite is pistachios, and I'm Ooh. going to garnish it with some pistachios. You know what we call all this? What? Schmaltz. It's like you're schmaltzing it up. Schmaltz. Or uh, as my as my mother used to say, ungapach. You know, like you got to get more is more. More like ungapach because here in the Hudson Valley. Our schmaltz is duck fat. Oh, no, yeah. I, so, I mean, we're not the literal. We're not taking, we're doing not the shot level. You're talking, <laughs> you're talking, exactly. You're talking to a chef who loves schmaltz. And then the final <laughs> ingredient 
which we're going to have a little bit and definitely say, and Emmy will join me in a Shekh Yuni. Wait, what is that? These are pomegranate oh, seeds. Beautiful. Yeah. Look at that. I give a bowl of water. Oh, yeah. so is, does everybody know how to make pomegranate seeds? The what do you mean how to make way, them? Well, the best way is how to make pomegranate seeds without getting dirty. You buy them in the store already done? Well, you do, but you take a pomegranate. You take a pomegranate. And that, David, that looks so gorgeous. Are you, you want to show everyone? I'm going to bring it back in one second. Okay. You take a pomegranate, and I'm going to step back because I'm not wearing an apron. And you cut the pomegranate. There's the pomegranate. And yes, if we sat down and counted, there's a, a nice drosh that says there's 613. And 13. Um, exactly. Six, not one more, not one less. Exactly. And so <laughs> then you cut it in quarters again, if you want. If you want, you can cut it into an eighth, whatever's easy to work with. And then you put it inside a bowl of water, Shelly, as you can see. And you put it in the water and you take the seeds out of the pith in the water. Huh. You put under the water, two things happen. The seeds do not break up and they um they sink to the bottom most of the pith goes to the top it's wow, that sounds like a good thing for emmy this, and tali to do yep she's still she's still um coring out the apples but i just wanted to show this to you quickly wow that's you know, cool i've never seen that and then you could see i mean i could use a strainer i'll just strain this in water and wow that was so much faster look at that it's perfect. That's uh, awesome. Because pomegranate juice, as you all know, can stain, and it's just tough to get out of. So let's put some more of this on top of our chicken. And then here's our pomegranate. This is our- Wow, milk. that looks beautiful. And My nice mouth is watering. We could put a little bit of- You know little... that there's um, a quotation in the Talmud, you'll appreciate this. There's no simcha without meat. Right. That's very good, which is why, which is why chicken is considered fleshach. Why? Because, because of celebration. Yeah, well, that's uh, not, that's different. not a reason, that's yeah. not the, the reason is because even though it's foul and it's not considered um, a meat, it's got the appearance and it could look like meat and we put a fence around it to protect ourselves from, from either thinking it's meat or someone thinking it's meat that we're eating it God forbid with dairy, right. but, it is. but it's not really meat. So this came out beautiful. Thank you, my assistants, Tali and Michelle and Shelly. But you know what? Let's have some pomegranate seeds. Oh. They're right here. Let's eat a few and we can say a shakhyuni. Michelle, I love that. Can we do it all together? Amen. 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 I have to find something else for next Friday night. So listen, this is like, you know, just the first of us creating these beautiful meals together and sharing memories. But hopefully we can do a Shahakianu for a different recipe. Even it won't be the first one, it'll be the first one of that recipe. I, I mean, very good. And I want to thank you, Robin, for your spiritual guidance and your friendship and your love and just your positive attitude towards me. It's really the first day we met. And uh, it is my pleasure and honor to have you as my friend and uh, Rabbi. Oh, I love you to pieces. And Emmy, it was so nice to see you. And I'm so glad that you helped us out here. And I guess you're going to have a good dinner tonight, huh? Yes. Uh, David. And the one, we're going to have. Oh, where are those? What? And the, and the one that's raw that we didn't cook, I guess we're having that tomorrow night. Oh, well, we could freeze it too, no? Right, you could freeze it. Because you may be like, you know, up to here with the chicken. <laughs> um, here. Rabbi Robin, can you um, email or or the the uh, recipe? Yes. Yes, it would be it would be great if you all would if you want the recipe sent to you. If you could put your email in the chat box, I will copy them before we get off. And this is Toby. <gasps> Toby. Hi, Munchkin. Uh, this is Toby. You, 
This is Toby. Emmy, I think he looks like you. Well, the girls are named after yes. my mom. Toby's named after my dad. And so, uh, Emmy, can I ask you a question? What's your favorite memory from Shabbat or holidays? Do you have a favorite like food memory? Passover. So what was it? Oh, Passover at your house. And what did we do? We always set the table with lots and lots and lots of frogs. Lots and lots and lots of frogs. That's right. Oh yes, of course. How nice. I love those are great memories, right? Do you always remember your grandpa? What do you call your grandpa? Grandpa? Mm -hmm. Yeah? No Saba, huh? No, uh, I'm Grandpa David. <laughs> nice. Again, I, uh, my father was Papa, my grandfather was Poppy, and so out of respect for them, I picked a different name. Nice. Um, David Schwadron, you are a blessing to Bobby, all of us. I love you with all my heart. I wish you Shana Tova Umituka, that it should be a beautiful, sweet new year, and that we have lots of reasons to celebrate and, and share memories together. Robin Fisher, I love you too and wish you the same. And I am Thank very you. I have the sweetness of my family, and I've been up here for two, three months, and it's just been an amazing blessing. You know, my son Jared just got married in July, and we went to visit our other son in, in Ohio, Kentucky, and we have a fourth who lives in Miami. So everybody, Baruch Hashem, is healthy and happy, and thank you. Beautiful. I love, thank you for sharing your family. Shelly, bye. Bye-bye. Bye to you, Emmy. Say bye to Polly and Toby, okay? All right. God bless bye, everyone. everybody. Thank bye. you, David. Thank, thank you, David. You, David. Thank you, brother Evan. My brother Evan. Yes. Nice. Hello. My sister, Melissa. Hello. Hello.